I want you to take your Bibles. We're going to be in several different scriptures, but we're going to start off in Psalms 139. And we're going to, I've got, a, I don't know, a dozen or more scriptures to give you. Last week, we began kind of a new mini-series that's a part of our building uh, that we're doing this year, building our relationships, building our love, building everything that we're building, uh, building in unity, building in every area of the church. We started last week talking about serving, and we uh, said last week that we were, uh, the, the title was Servitude in the Church, and we talked about serving with the right attitude last week, and as we, uh, each, each month, we, I think, uh, not this month, but last month, I think we recognized them, uh, all of our children workers in that department. This month, we're doing the production, and, and next month, there'll be another area that will be uh, just, you know, giving praise to those ones that are serving in that area. But we want to make sure, as we're serving, though, that we have the right attitude of serving. And so today we're going to kind of, kind of continue in that mode of that. And, you know, most of you would, would probably consider that if you think about our physical bodies, our physical bodies that were created by God really is a marvelous display of God's wisdom. I mean, you think about our, you know, just our, how our bodies function. I mean, it's just amazing, you know, that, that anybody could think that that just evolved. You know, that we rolled up on some beach, you know, as a little sail, and then it sprang into a monkey, and then somehow, you know, and of course, I, my, my clue to that one is, of, of evolution with the monkeys, is why when I go to the zoo, they steal monkeys, and ain't none of them in there ever just, boop, became a person. Right? I mean, it, that would make sense if you believed in evolution. But to look at our bodies and think, man, God is amazing, isn't he? And how he's created us. And, 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 and we, you know, we look at just how our, you, know, you look at a child. I love to, this morning I have my, my, grand, my, my youngest grandbaby here. And, you know, when you see her and you see uh, her fingers and her toes, and, man, you go, man, there's just no way that it just evolved. Only a God could do that. I like what the psalmist says here in Psalms 139. And I'm just going to start reading in verse 13. And, and, and you probably have read this before. You need to know this about you. He says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. He has it all planned. He, he, he's been working in all this since the, before we were born, that he knew you. I mean, he knew, he, he formed you, you know, and, and so we need to get that concept because of what we're going to be talking about today and how, how, the, how the, the Word of God deals with the body of Christ compared to the physical body. And so we need to see how they work together. So, because you know, we would all understand how the body works and designed and how miraculous that is, but then God comes along and gives us Scripture about how the church should look like our physical bodies and how they work together with that. If you would, go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, when, when people in the, churches, in the church begins to understand the uh, incredible effectiveness that we can have today. See, some people think, man, we just, we're not very effective. The church, folks, is effective. You know, if you think there's chaos, wait till the church is out of the way. Wait till the church is gone. Wait till the church is gone, and, and then you're going to really know what chaos is all about. But listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4. He said, But speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body joined 
and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, and causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I want you to notice the emphasis here of the importance of everybody being involved. Not 80%, not 90% of the work being done by 10 to 20% of the people. Uh, the church organized around just a few superstars. No, the whole body works together, just as our physical body does. You know, there, there's parts of the physical body that we can see, but then there are parts of our physical bodies that we don't even see. You know, you, 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 we have these things called a pancreas. We have these lungs. I, I can't see them, but they're in there functioning. They're very important. And they're functioning, and they have a part. And he, he, he's, he's comparing that here in, in Ephesians, how, you know, every joint that has been put together with the body of Christ supplies. Yes, some may have a look on the outside, maybe a more supply, but as I said, I can't see my lungs and I can't see my heart, but you take them away. So that's how important each person is in the body of Christ. This is what we've been learning all this year, is how important we need each other. You know, as we continue to grow and we continue to move uh, closer to the things that God has in store for the church, churches that, 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 that understand what it means to be the body, those, those are the churches that are going to be consistent and they're going to function in the right way. I want to be an effective, functioning church. And, 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 and so with this metaphor that he's using, that we can be incredibly effective and, and literally what we call a healthy church in our physical bodies when things go wrong and we're not healthy the whole body suffers because of that the church is in our church body you know if, if one part is not right it affects the whole body so we want to see a, a healthy body and a healthy church that, that that comes to the aid of each other as we've been talking about uh, so far this year and so this metaphor of how incredibly effective we are when we're doing what god has designed but the flip side is if the group's not functioning like a body then there's going to be some things that will occur. I wrote down three things that can happen. One, either resources are being left off the table. Something doesn't get done. Something doesn't happen because the body's not functioning like it should. Part of the bodies uh, are, are going to be used, and, and, and therefore spiritual gifts won't be used. See, because God gives us all spiritual gifts. Some may have one, some may have more. But you're given those gifts to use for the body and so we don't understand how to function the way we're supposed to function then that gift doesn't get operated and the church doesn't get to feed off of that and become healthy oh, the way it needs to be and so no matter who you are today you're a part of the body of Christ you have a function you have a gift and the gift has to be exercised the gift has to be used for the body and so when we don't, that's what happens. It gets left off the table, and we miss out. Another thing that can happen is the body is not nearly as effective as it could be. It's like we could be good, or we could be great. Many churches of the day are good. I don't want to be just good. I want to be great. This is why we have to understand what it means in our service, as we started last week. Servitude is having the right function of how we do this and then as the body not nearly as effective and potential but also the body parts uh there's are sometimes when like if there's a uh, uh something that's defective in our body and other parts of the body have to take on the work for the parts that are not i i i had football injuries and stuff on my left knee and i can walk but from the years of having to depend on my other knee to take the weight and sometimes the traction 
that my bad knee doesn't do very well with, I've actually started wearing out the cartilage in my good knee because it got overloaded taking the load, especially when I was a lot more load to, to, <laughs> to have to carry around. This is one of the reasons why I got rid of that load is because this poor old knee's like, dude, you got to you got to let loose. <laughs> you know, you're killing this one, you know. But but our, but th- th- this knee starts wearing out. That's what happens in the church when people go, "Oh man, I'm not important." And then somebody else is overloaded, and the next thing you know, they're like, "I can't do this anymore, Pastor. I'm tired. I, I need a break. I, I got to have some relaxation." And we talked about that last week. There's times to get refreshed. There's times to sit and soak. But we also said last week, sometimes you sit and soak so long you become stinky and stale. It doesn't, you know, it's like we get that stagnation that takes place and all that junk grows on top of a pond. We don't, we want to be like a river where we're flowing with freshness. And so there is that time to relax. There is that time to refresh. But then there's that time to jump back in because I don't want to overload someone else. This is why we say in every area, listen, we can have, you cannot have too many children's workers. You can't. You say, well, man, they got a bunch of them. Yeah, but can you imagine if we had so many children's workers that you only had to serve one Sunday a month or one Sunday every two months? That would be excellent. Now, I'm going to just brag on my North Augusta folk. We are above average for New Life Church when it comes to our children's workers. We are. So when when, when those that work in children's work, you think, oh, my goodness, wish we had more uh, we are above the average but we want to not be good we want to be great and so the more it gets involved the more that gets involved in production the less that you have to serve every week and and so the the load gets taken off of one or two three or four and it begins to be dispersed and then that's how the body begins to stay healthy but if not it begins to put an overload and, and maybe even damage because they're trying to carry more weight and the responsibility than we were destined to carry. So that's how important we have to understand how this body works. And so with, with those things that we're looking at, the question is, is that every church family has to face is, are we functioning like a healthy body should? Just think about that. Are we functioning? And when I say are we Think about you as an individual. Am I functioning in my part in the local church? You know, not, don't always just look at your neighbor. We look at ourselves. Am I functioning like a healthy body should? What steps do we need to take to get better uh, in, 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 in the days ahead? Because we want to continue to build. We're building, we're building, we're building, we're building uh, on everything that we do. And so with those questions in mind, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And even though we're in the servitude uh, little series we're in, this morning we're talking about the stewardship of serving. The stewardship of serving. Now, how do we get to the place where every person in the body is functioning the way God designed? That's what we're looking at. The word that's used that you will see over and over is about being a steward. A steward. And it's used in the Bible to describe a a servant. Uh, Someone who is appointed to in an authority position over a certain portion of the master's household. In other words, as a steward, you're not the owner. One of the things that 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 I want to talk about this morning is the difference between ownership and stewardship. Ownership and stewardship. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, do this like it's yours. And I go, mm, not me. Do this like it's his. Because I'm just going to tell you, sometimes I can get a little lazy. And if I do it the way I want to get it done, it might not be as effective. You know, I shared this before about one of our uh, members who's homebound now, but I used to go over and, uh, to John Hooper's house and I would borrow his tools. And it's because I didn't have mine anymore because I had let mine sit out in the yard from the last time I was working on something. And they had got rained on and they had gotten rusted and they weren't working. 
And so I borrow someone else's. Now, now when they're given to me, I'm not the owner of those tools. I am the steward of those tools. And so I would take care of them. And when I got done, I didn't leave them in the yard like I did my tools because these aren't mine. And so I'm not taking ownership of his tools. I am taking stewardship of his tools. I'm the manager of them at this moment, but I am not the owner. And that's the way we look at serving as a steward. We don't, we're not, we don't own the department that we may serve in, but we are the stewards of that. Whether you're over that ministry or you work in that ministry, you're a steward. You're a steward in, 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 in being a greeter. You're a steward in, in, in hospitality. You're a steward in production. You're a steward on the worship team. You're a steward... Uh, in children's ministry. We're, we're stewards. If you're, if you're doing photography, you're a steward of that ministry, not the owner. When you realize you're not the owner, then we have less work of getting ourselves uh, bent out of shape when something doesn't go our way. Because yeah. we don't own this. So our job is just to do it as a steward. And a steward is, is a servant who's appointed. Now, remember, uh, during this time that they would talk about stewards, they would be left in charge of maybe a vineyard in the Bible. Maybe they were a steward of a farm uh, or either some other a- aspect of that household. But it was a position of trust. I mean, the, the, the owner would not just put anybody as a steward. It had to be someone that when that owner was out of town, the master was gone, that they knew that it would be taken care of the way they wanted it to be taken care of. Not the steward, but the owner. The steward would always see what the owner wanted. And so sometimes if we just own, we want to do, well, this will get me by. But as a steward, we want to do above and beyond. That's the attitude that we have. We want to go above and beyond uh, for the steward. So it's a position of trust. It's a position of honor. And it's a position of accountability. You know, I always say with people, you know, people will only rise up what you expect of them. I have great expectation for the people of North Augusta. Because if I don't have any expectation of you, then you don't, you don't, you know, so I'm like, no, I want our people who serve here to know that I'm looking at you with great expectation. Your bar is up here, right? Because if I only expect this of you, then, you know, you get that. And so we have a great expectation. That, that, that owner, that master would have a great expectation uh, and a great position uh, of that accountability for that person that's in that position as a steward and you know and it's interesting that when, when God was selecting words to describe people who have chosen to become believers and followers of Christ that that word is used to be a steward and look what he says in 1 Corinthians 4 2 because see not just a steward but he says moreover it is required in stewards that one be found what? Faithful. So, a steward, not just a steward, but one that will be a faithful steward. One that can be trusted. One that can be accounted on. One that can you can know that, man, there's nothing like for a pastor to know. Because some, sometimes people will come to me and they go, uh, what do we do here in, in the production? What do we do here in children's department? And I go, I don't know. I don't have no idea, but I got people that do. And I trust that those people, and I have that accountability with those people, that those people that are in that position, they got it. And then I don't have to be burdened with it. I've been in that position as a pastor where I had to be burdened about every position and everything that went on in the church, and that will wear that, like that knee that got wore out over here, even though it was good, it was always... But when every joint is supplying and everything is happening, the stewardship is happening, the favor it, it is required. And I love what he says here. He didn't say it's an option that as a steward we be found faithful. 
if I want to be, if everything went like I wanted, if I feel good today. You know, remember last week, you know, I gave some examples of, you know, what happens. You know, we don't, you know, well, I, 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 I stayed up too late last night, and I don't want to serve today. Well, then that puts the burden. That puts the burden, you know. Or, you know, I, I had a bad morning. Bless your heart. You know, had a fight with my boo thing. Come to church. I, I don't think I want to do the day. No, no, no. You're, you're not the owner of that. You're the steward of that. And so we steward that and go, you know, I may not always feel like, I don't always feel like I want to preach. Now, that's very rare because I love to preach. But, you know, sometimes I stay up late on Saturday night. I'm like, oh, goodness, it's Sunday morning. You know, if I, and then I talked about last week, you know, call Bart. Hey, Mark. Mm. Stayed up and watched that movie. And how about covering it today? You know. No, I, I'm the steward of, of, the, of this part of, this is my part. This is my puzzle piece, you know. And if every joint supplying, we have to not overload. Now, stuff happens. People get sick. I thought a few months back, it was like one Sunday I did call Mark. And I said, hey, we're at the emergency room with Tina. She's got kidney issues and with kidney stones and where I said you got to go with it, man, you know. And then it was just like a few weeks later, I get a call and go, "Hey, uh, you're gonna have to make sure everything's done today." I'm at the hospital with Christina, and then we, she she can't stand up. She wasn't drunk; she had vertigo. And, 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 and <laughs> thanks for clarifying. And, and so you know, and so but stuff like that happens. But we are a good steward about it. It's not like well, every week I wonder if they're gonna show. Ever work with people that you don't know if they're gonna be there? Yeah, we do. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach all of our volunteers that. When they send out what they want you to serve, you get to deny or, or accept. If you're going to be there, accept, please. Because then we get here Sunday and go, is so-and-so coming? I don't know. They didn't accept. They didn't deny. So we're sitting around waiting. And then you show up, and then we go, okay, now we can move on. Or we got to go get someone to f take over that spot even though they might have worked last week, they got to do it again this week because, okay, that's another sermon for another day. But moreover, it is required. Say required. It's required in stewards that one be found faithful. So here at New Life, North Augusta, we are devoting this series that we started last week to think about the many of the things that God has entrusted us. God has entrusted us with things. And what He has given to us he, we've given some God has blessed us here at this ministry God has blessed us at New Life God has blessed us at North Augusta and, 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 and so you know, we want to be found faithful and trustworthy in that so this morning I want you to think about the, the spiritual gifts that God has given every person we talked a little bit about that a while ago you know, every, if you're here today and you're a believer you've been given spiritual gifts part of your spiritual giftedness is in your serving as a steward you know, you may not work necessarily in a particular ministry, but God has still given you a spiritual gift to be used. God may use you to go give someone a word of knowledge. God may use you to go pray over someone. God may use you to... We always got to be, you know, on the sidelines, kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the guy on the sideline, and he's waiting for his chance, and the coach comes up and says, You ready? A real football player is ready. See, some people just want to have the uniform. They like sitting on the bench and be a part of the team. You know, uh, y'all know I'm, most of y'all know I'm a Georgia fan. And uh, hey, don't hate, appreciate. But our our quarterback has been on the team this this is his fourth year and and he got to be part of the back-to-back -back national championships that we had uh, a couple years ago he was on the team but when you talk to him he went yeah I was on the team but I was on the bench now that I'm a player I want us to win a championship as a player 
See, he didn't want to just be on the bench and say, hey, I got the T-shirt and I got the ring for my championship. I want to participate in that. So you may be, at times, you may be sitting on the bench, but be ready when the coach says, get in. Get in. Don't go, well, you ain't ever called on me before. No, get in there. Now is your time. Now shine. And that's what, you know, and so we got to always be ready. And so, you know, here at North Augusta, we're doing that, and we're being faithful and trustworthy, and we want to be focused in because we want to be effective. We want to be effective in building up what God is wanting to do. I want to very quickly give you four principles as we're continuing in this, four principles of stewardship. And you might want to write these down. If you don't write, write them in somebody else's book next to you or Bible next to you because you want to have these because these are things that I go back to. Because, see, when, when you get into the battles and you get into life, sometimes I have to go back to these, these principles to help me stay, stay with it. Principle number one is, is God owns everything and we own nothing. He owns it all. And so I have to keep that as a principle and know that. Number two, God entrusts us with everything that we have. He owns it all, but then He in turn entrusts us with everything. And I mean everything, not just your, what you do at church, with everything about your life, your finances, your family, your job, your, everything. Is that, yeah, He owns it, and we own nothing, but He entrusts us. And then thirdly, we can either increase or diminish what God has given us. We, it, that's up to us. Now, God wants us to increase. What is the story of the talents? He gave one ten, one five, one one. The guy that got ten increased. The guy that got five increased. The, the guy that had one said, you know what? I don't want to waste. And so he took the one and buried it. And then when the owner came back, because he entrusted them, he looked at the guy with 10 and said, hey, wow, look what you did with what I gave you. He looked at the guy with five, look what, wow, good and faithful servant. And then the guy got one, he goes, you sorry buzzard head. And he took the one that he had and gave it to the one that had 10. He said, well, that ain't fair. It is fair because he gave it to the one who he knew was going to do something with it. And so the guy with one misses out. So it doesn't matter if you have one spiritual gift, you have ten spiritual gifts, you use it. Because if you do one and you do it faithfully, God might give you another. But if we don't, then we diminish the giftedness. So we can either increase or diminish what God has given us. And number four of the principles is we can be called into account at any time. And it may be today. See, because... As a believer, you're not going to stand in judgment of your sins. You're not. That's already been judged. We're guilty. That was already taken care of. Christ took care of that. But when we get to heaven, we will be judged on our works of what we've done since our salvation. Did we do them for us or did we do them for him? And so they're going to be tested. And so he, he at any time could call into account what we've been doing. At any time. We never know when the, when the, when the master's going to show up. You know, it, it, sometimes we like to kind of know things. That way we know, you know, oh, I haven't been really doing like I should, but he's coming next week, so we're going we're gonna to do a, you know, we, we, we rented out our house for, for the masters this time. And, 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 and because of the effectiveness that I am, I wait for the week before we're leaving to go on vacation to get everything ready. Uh, even though I've known for months we're doing this, uh, I find it more effective. No. <laughs> and so, and so we really been, you know, the, la the last two weeks is just like I was glad to get on that boat because you know we we were been booking it, you know, trying to get everything done because I knew that next week they were coming. But see, if I don't know whether it's next week or today, if I keep it clean, this is what Tina told me when we got home from the Masters, and we got home and walked in and everything was so bright and in this place. She said, wouldn't it be nice if we kept it this way? I'm like, 
Like, the Masters is over, baby. We ain't. Well, she said, wouldn't it be nice to come home and it's so peaceful and it's, everything is in its place. The, your, your dresser's not cluttered with all your stuff in your pockets. And, 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 the, and, the, and the bathroom counter, you can actually see it and all that. And, you know, and because what, what if the guest showed up tomorrow? See, then it would already be done. So we don't know when the master is going to say, hey, I'm taking account of what I've given you. And so we got to always be ready. And a faithful steward will always be ready. So those four principles are important to us. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read all of this because I want us to get the understanding of this uh, in this today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. And this is talking about unity and diversity in the body. Okay? This is the functioning thing of it. And here's what he says. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, he, he's, he, he's, he's talking about the physical body here, you know, and I have many parts. You have fingers, toes, nose, ears, but it's still one body. For instance, even this local church, we're one body, but we're a part of the body. We're just a part of the whole body of Christ. And, and so he says, this is how it works. So also is Christ. And he says in verse 13, For by one spirit, this is how you got into that body, by the way. For by one spirit were you all baptized. Just so you know, this is not talking about water baptism. Water baptism doesn't get you in the body. This is a spiritual baptism. That happens the moment you place your faith and trust in Christ. You are baptized into that body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, that's important because think about this. He's, he's speaking to a time when there were slaves and then there were free in a congregation. And what he's literally telling them, you that were slaves are at the same position in Christ as the ones that are not the slaves. It's like, we got unity and diversity. If the, if, if, if the church would get a hold of that and just understanding that we're, we're not fighting each other and it's not about this race or that race or this, this, this. No, we're, we're one. We're one body. We're one body. And we need to understand that we've all been made to drink into that one spirit. Verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? You can say it all you want, but it is. Verse 16. And if the ear should say, hey, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? You, you, we. I can just see Paul writing this and the people reading this for the first time. It's like, well, that don't make no sense. Why would he say that? Because this is what we got to get the understanding of the church for. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? See, if everybody, see, because here's what happens sometimes in our area of, of serving. People who have just a, a gift of, of, of service of, you know, cleaning up and throwing away the trash and, and picking up trash, a lot of times if we're not careful, we'll look around and go, man, I'm the only one doing this. Why is it always me and a couple of others doing all of this? Well, if you'll stop and look around, they're probably doing something too. And if everybody was doing this, then this wouldn't get done. If everybody was doing that, then that wouldn't get done. And so we look at it and go, if the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing? If the whole were the hearing, then where would the smelling? Every joint supplies. He says in verse 18, But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. He's the one that's put this thing together. And if they, have, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. No, 
Much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Wow. For those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our, in our unpresentability un, uh, parts have greater modesty. But our presentable, this I said earlier, can't see my heart and lungs, but they serve a purpose. But what you can see is great. But see, my hands and fingers, great. But you can't see my brain. But without my brain, these, these don't do this. So sometimes we think because someone's not seen that they're not important. Oh, no, they're more important. They're more important according to, according to scriptures. So he says, but our, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it that there should be no schisms in the body. The word schisms means division. There'd be no division. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ. And members individually. So you're a member individually, but you are the body of of Christ, and so we're we're looking at this, looking at the stewardship of serving. And I want you to understand this: that, that when he's talking about this body, he gives these metaphors of the physical body and how it fits today as a good steward in the body of Christ. Number one is a wise stewardship of service requires an appreciation of the unity of the body of Christ. See, when you begin to understand what it means to have, be a faithful servant, you begin to understand how important unity is. Unity is absolutely essential in the church. Sadly, across at least America, most churches today are not in unity. Now, it doesn't mean uniformity. You know, we may have different views on things. That's something we're talking about. But we're talking about in an agreement with unity. If you go on and read in Ephesians, he's talking about he gives us the ones. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one... All these... These are our one. And we have to stay in unity. Where there's unity, the Old Testament says it commands the blessing. We want a blessing on new life. We want a blessing on North Augusta. Then we will keep the unity. We will strive it. We will... Do, God gives unity, but we'll protect it. Like a guard dog, I will protect the unity. If I see a, a schism starting to happen, I am on it like a hound dog. Nip it, Barney Five. Nip it in the bud, exactly. I will, because that that's my part of the puzzle that I'm intentional about seeing that it gets done, and that is we stay in unity. Because when the unity goes. But the more we understand stewardship as being wise about that, we will all have that same fight to keep unity. This is what he said. Look back there at 12 and 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, all have been made to drink into that one spirit. Now, when you think about that, think about the things he says and how he says it. He says, he says that being many, we are one body. So also, he could have said the church. But he didn't say the church, he said Christ. So he's really demonstrating that this oneness, this unity came from him. And, and, and about what he's about. Matter of fact, when you look at, uh, you, you can read them on your own. We don't have time to read them all. But if you read chapter 12 uh, through chapter 14, all of it is focused on how to handle and be good stewards of the gift that God has given to us. So I challenge you to read that sometime. Get in there, find out what it means to do that. Uh, all, all the chapters are in that, those 12 through 14. But in here in, in chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 that we just read, they focus on the unity aspect of it. Do it with unity. That's what a good steward does. 
And so he begins to get in there, and, and I want to call it an argument, but he begins to get in there and demonstrate this, Paul does, to Corinth, to Corinth, because remember what was going on at Corinth. They were had lost the divisions. Matter of fact, the church of Corinth was the most spiritually gifted church of all the churches that Paul started. Most spiritually gifted. Sadly, they were the most divided church that Paul started. So you can't judge your spiritual growth on how many spiritual gifts that you have. Doesn't work. That's not how it goes. So we have to look at it and go, wait a minute. If he's taking a church that has all these spiritual gifts and he's sometimes correcting them, he's trying to get them to understand because they, they can't have all these divisions and schisms and all the dividing that takes place. No, they got to be in unity. And what makes our physical bodies amazing is not just the individual parts, but how they all work together. No part of my body decides it's going to do its own little thing. No. No. It, they all, they work together in harmony. They work together. You you, you know I use it, keep using my fingers. You know by itself, I mean you know fingers are kind of impressive. They're kind of cool looking. They can, they are. They're kind of cool. But if they're disconnected from the brain, what happens? Nothing. They don't move on their own. The brain tells it. There's a connection. There's a unity. When, when, when something happens, you go get, you, you hit your head and you have a concussion, and part of that brain kind of gets a little bit off, something might not work. That's what happens in the body of Christ. We have to keep that unity constantly going. And so, yeah, by itself, it's, it, it's impressive, but what takes the discussion a higher is the connection of every part working together. And your fingers, they have the brain, but boy, how awesome it is that the fingers are all connected on one hand. And that he gave us five fingers, and he gave us this funny one on the end, the thumb. If he had made the thumb look like the rest of them, try to do things without your thumb. It makes it difficult. It makes it difficult. And they had to be connected to this hand because just out there by themselves wouldn't really do much. You know, if he had put my fingers up here on my elbow, it, wouldn't, it, would, have, it would have been hard. So he, he purposely put everything exactly where it needed to be. He's put you exactly where you needed to be in the body of Christ to function. And so it works in concert with each other. And when you're, I mean, you know, for instance, when you, when you came this morning, your fingers were working, your feet were working, your eyes were working, your mouth was working. All of you had to be involved to get here. All of you. You couldn't just say, hey, this hand ain't acting right. I'm going to leave y'all here. No, you got to come because we're all coming together. This whole body's coming together. And see, this is why I tell people, listen, go, 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 go refresh, go get away. But we need you to get back here because we want to be able to function great, not just good. And you're important. You're needed and you're important. So all the parts simultaneously working together is a beautiful thing. Just harmony. You know, you, you take someone who writes music. If you play some of those notes individually, eh. But when they all, when that orchestra gets in there and they play all their stuff together, you know, I mean, you just clang on a cymbal. It gets kind of loud and annoying. Sorry there, Corey. But just by itself, just hitting that cymbal. But when the cymbal is being hit and the, and the and, well, maybe sometimes the keyboard is hitting the right place, and the guitar and the bass, and, and, and then they all come together, what would by itself be just, eh, becomes a beautiful thing. If you got up here and sang soprano by yourself, eh, if you got up here and sang alto, it really would be like, whoa. But when you bring all the voices together, ooh, this is good. Y'all sounded good this morning, by the way. 
it was good. When, when God looked out at his creation, he said, hmm, this is good. When God looks at the body of Christ, he wants to say, hmm, this is good. And so we want to be good stewards and be where he can look at us and say, this is good. I like this. And so this is what, all together, they work together. They work together. And so look at verse 12 again. He says, for as the body is one and has many members, all the members of that one body, many but one. You, you have individual gifts, but they only work in concert with the other people around you. They work together. They fit together. They perfectly. The Lord demonstrated his appreciation even when he was here on earth. Because what did he do? And Jesus was, wasn't a long ranger. Now, he could have been. If anybody could have been a long ranger in their walk, it could have been Jesus. But what did he choose to do? He, did, he chose to work with other people. He chose to work with others. And so Jesus has disciples and he pours into them, and he, and he works with them, and, and because there's a, a mission to accomplish. One person can do a mission and take forever. A concert of people doing it together makes it run more smoothly and more effectively. So he purposely chose to work with the disciples. He purposely chose to even identify himself with us. Challenge you sometime to go read uh, Romans chapter 6 through Romans chapter 8. Because he, he gives us our union with Christ and he explains spiritual gifts there because uh, we don't have time to go to all these spiritual gifts that's been given to us. And he talks about how that unity makes it powerful there. So read Romans 6 through 8 when you get time. Because uh, Jesus said this in John 15. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much Fruit. But then he says this, apart from me, you can do nothing. We, we don't bear much fruit as an individual part. We bear much fruit when we're in unity together. See, if, if my tree looks really good and I've got all kind of fruit and someone else's tree is kind of puny looking, then what needs to happen is, instead of going, oh, we need to get rid of that tree. No, we need to cultivate on that one so this one can come up. Not that we all go down, but this one can be brought up so that we can make much fruit together. More productive. More productive. And so, you know, a finger without the hand isn't worth much, but you get it on the hand and you get the brain involved, wow, we can accomplish great things. The reason some, some people are not being very effective is because they have not found the way to connect their spiritual gift to the body. I was actually had a conversation with a person this week, or no, last week. It wasn't, I was on a cruise, so I didn't do a whole lot. I did a little bit. I had somebody I was kind of counseling with a private message, but this was about a week before. And this person made the statement to me that, because I had talked about how important the local church is. And they said, hey, my spiritual growth has blossomed since I haven't been to church. And I'm like, you're stupid. Are you kidding me? That is ignorance past seed. I mean, you, 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 there is no way that you, you may think that your spiritual growth has grown, but when you disconnect from the body, how can you do that? It doesn't work. God designed us to be together, to function together, to bear much fruit together. The spiritual gifts are used in the church. What you going to do with your spiritual gift on your couch? It doesn't work. I don't care. You know, I've had people say to you, oh, me and God, we, we out there on my tractor, and that, that's how we do our thing. That's great. You need to have your time on the tractor with God. But then he's preparing you to get your butt in church and work your spiritual gift together. We all have our part. We have to be doing it. We don't want to be good. We want to be great. We want to be great. We want to be like Tony the Tiger. Great. But many people miss that because they, they don't connect the spiritual gifts 
are important to have when we're with the body. And so to take that one step further, I love what the Lord does. He values the unity of the body. And so what does he do? He purposely chooses to identify himself with those whom we minister. That's what Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he wanted everybody to be involved. He said in Matthew 18, 5, Whoever receives one little child, this, is, this in my name receives me. How important it is it? See, when we're connecting with someone else, we're connecting with him. If you don't connect with other people, that's how, how do you think you're connecting with him? You know, it's, it's like what he said in Matthew 25, and the king will answer and say, you know, most assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it unto uh, the least of these, you've done it unto me. Because they were like, he says, you know, you fed me, you clothed me. And he's like, when, when, did, when did we do that? When did, when did you feed me? When did I feed the Lord? When, when, did, when, did, I, when did I give clothes to the Lord? And that's when he said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so as we do unto others, and we do it, we're doing it to the Lord. This is what we learned last week about a servitude, is when you serve, you don't serve for you, you serve for Him. And when you're serving from Him, then you don't burn out, you don't get mad, take your stuff and go home because it ain't yours to take home. And that's how it works. So just like the individual parts of our physical bodies illustrates the importance of how unity also is Christ. He compares us to Christ. He's chosen to organize his ministry then and even now around this important principle of unity together with him that's how it works now also is the holy spirit also delights in unifying an unlikely group of people you look out at a crowd and a bunch of people and you go how with all the diversity can all these people get together now a few months ago Y'all remember my puzzle? I think it was a thousand-piece puzzle. And no one part looked like the other. All of them had different shapes, but yet they all connected together to make a beautiful picture. And then we illustrated that if, if, if everybody decided that they didn't want to be with the body, we demonstrated that by me throwing the puzzle. And we ended up all over the place. And it wasn't pretty. It was a mess. And so when we begin to understand that the Holy Spirit delights in unifying things that look on, how can, how can this piece fit with this piece? Yeah, because there's another piece that fits in the middle that makes them connect. That's the body. That's us. That's us. It, it, it's miraculous is what that is. And so... What it means to you and I is that as Christ, as Savior and our Lord, we work with Him, and there's no question that God has entrusted us with these spiritual gifts, and we serve them as stewards each and every week with the body of Christ. You may not work in children, but you may be a prayer warrior. You may be contacting people during the week that, that maybe we hadn't seen in a little bit, and we encourage them. And, and this group has their place. And every part it looks different, but man, when they come together, it's a beautiful picture. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says this. First Peter 4, 10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. How? As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You've been given a gift. Your gift wasn't given to you to parade around around your neck. What you got there? <laughs> My gift. I'm an encourager. Who do you encourage? Me. It's my gift. It's my spiritual gift. Y'all see my spiritual gift? I'm going to get it on my T-shirt next week so I don't have to wear this. It'll be on my gift. It'll be my gift. I have my last name on the back. My gift. So... Your gift is, only matters if you're using the gift. And when you're using your gift, you don't have to tell people what you got. You don't have to go around and tell people you have the gift of mercy. It's obvious because you're showing mercy. 
don't have to we don't have to wear it around our neck why because we received a gift we minister it one to another how as a good steward of the manifold grace of God because the gift that we got we didn't get because we deserved it we got it because of the grace of God and so by using that gift we're good stewards of it even though it's not ours we don't own it we take stewardship of it and we use it every gift is important and I believe in every church the gifts are given that, that, that there's not a gift that's not given in that congregation. Now, I can't tell you that it's always used because some people may not use it. That's why I'm saying, don't miss out because someone may have needed your gift today. And if you don't use it, somebody walks out of here with a missingness that they could have filled because you had that gift to give them today. Always be ready. Always be ready. A wise steward of serving requires an appreciation for the diversity of the body. Man, when you get when you get an appreciation like that, it, it just like understanding that listen, as soon as we get into unity, uh, we we give equal attention to the diversity. I am so glad that we're diverse. I'm glad we ain't all the same. You know how boring that would be? You know, some people say, I want to be in a church where everybody's like this. I want to be in a church where everybody's like this. I want to be in a church where everybody's my color. I want to be in a church where... I don't. I want to be in diverse. And the more diverse, the better. I love diversity. I love the different backgrounds that we have. You know, some of you, as I get to know you and I hear your background, I go, wow, how in the world... God, only you could put that together. Man, I love diversity. A good steward... Will, will, will understand that and appreciate it. They'll appreciate it. See, your spiritual gift is needed by all of us. And Paul, Paul's trying to get his readers to, 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 to look at that and just use this crazy thing of taking the human body to get that point across. It's important. Just because you have, you know, maybe you've concluded that, 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 that your gift is not needed, does it make that not a conclusion? Maybe you have a gift and maybe it didn't get needed today. But you were on the bench waiting because the coach, who is the Lord, might have said, all right, you're in. Or I gave this gift to somebody else today, and they didn't show or they didn't use it, so you're in. See, a, a good football team doesn't have a first and second string. Everybody is a starter. You just may be on the bench waiting your time, but you're a starter. See, because if you ever think you're not a starter, then you'll think I'm not important. I'm on the bench. I'm not important. Oh, yeah, you are. You know? That second-string quarterback, he's one play away from being the, the guy. If he just sits around and goes, oh, I don't care. Oh, they're the playbook when it's my time. Quarterback gets hurt in the first quarter. You going to go? I ain't learned the playbook, Coach. I, I just assumed that this guy was going to play and be the starter because I didn't get the starting job. We're in trouble. Because our backup ain't ready. So you're a starter. Everybody's a starter. You just may get delayed when you go in the game. So we won't be ready. Has your foot ever gone to sleep on you? That's a rough situation, isn't it? Everybody's here and available except that right foot. It's like, come on, man, wake up. Let's go, let's go. Get this thing moving. We got to be ready. Another thing that happens when we're doing this like we're supposed to, we don't get envious. Well, if I can't do that, then I'm not going to do anything. Mm -mm. We have to be aware of that, because that's how the devil wants. What did James say in James 3.16? For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. If there's confusion, there's no unity. 
And so he says, no, 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 get rid of that. Yeah, but they didn't ask me to do it. It's okay. You don't know what else is coming. You've got to be ready. So we have to be always connected to be a steward as we serve. Amen? Let's stand together. Be a steward. God may have just only given you the gift of taking the garbage to the dumpster after church. But you do it. You do it like you're at the, at the king's house taking out his garbage because that's what you're doing. You're taking out the king of king's garbage. Everything's important. Every joint supplies. And we don't want to be good. We want to be great. Amen.